over the last decade, the m- number of collisions that have, uh, people being hit by in, 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 on residential roads have increased by 38% in London. Hmm. Yeah. Um, what we saw was in the academic study showed that actually when you put in these low traffic neighborhoods, a 50% fall in collision rates in the first six months of these going in. You know, that's, that's unheard of in terms of the, the benefits of built for safety. So suddenly you're creating safe, clean environments for people to, to move through. Mimicking in a way what I was talking about, those spaces for family. When you reduce the traffic, people enjoy the streets, people take to the streets, they use them differently. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that was Will Norman, the mayor's walking and biking commissioner for the city of London, England. Uh, It is a fascinating conversation and it's a long one, so we're gonna get right to it pretty fast, but I do have one quick thing that I wanna share with you right up front here. So if you bear with me just a moment, I just wanted to say that I am going to be heading back to the Netherlands to attend the International Cargo Bike Festival, and those dates are the 27th through 29th of October this year, and uh, I'm going to be putting together a little bit of a makeshift study tour uh, in the days leading up to and or um, after the event. So if you are interested in attending this event and coming along with me, (laughs) or joining me, I'm going anyways, uh, just let me know. And uh, you can do that by simply sending me an email at john at activetowns.org. Okay, without further delay, let's get right to it with Will Norman. Well, hey, this is John with the Active Towns Initiative and the Active Towns Podcast, and I am absolutely delighted to have with me here in the uh, Active Towns Podcast, Ecamm Studios, Will Norman from London. Welcome. Hey John, nice to meet you, and uh, and thanks for having me on the on the podcast. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so as I mentioned, you're in London, and I don't mean fake London, London, Ontario. I mean London, England, <laughs> across we the pond. We are very much London, England. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so, why don't we do this to get, kick this off? Um, why don't you just give a really brief introduction of yourself, and then we'll uh, we'll let this uh, take it where it will. So my name's Will Norman. I'm the the Mayor of London's Walking and Cycling Commissioner. Um, I'm the London's first Walking and Cycling Commissioner. And uh, my job is, well, on paper, it's pretty straightforward. It's like, how do we get more people walking and cycling? What can we be doing as a city to enable more people to switch their journeys from polluting cars to greener, cleaner, healthier, enjoyable ways of getting around the city, like walking and cycling? That's on paper. In, in the reality, it's a bit harder to do than uh, than, than that, probably that description uh, uh, sort of uh, that, that that description uh, that, that implies. Yeah. So, and and that's funny that you say that it's it's harder than than it just sounds on paper and everything, because uh, we're talking about. Uh, a lot of different things. We're talking about human behavior and shifting trends, and we're talking about infrastructure. Um, Talk a little bit about um, your history and your past. How did you come to this role? So I am not, I'm not an expert and uh, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an expert in town planning anyway. Actually, I studied as, a, as an anthropologist. I did a PhD in anthropology. I spent 18 months living in a mud hut on the border between South Africa and Mozambique a long time ago. Um, but I, I, so I come at this from very much a research perspective. I was, I was a researcher. I spent a lot of time looking at how people live their lives, shaping human behavior. How does that Will flow out into policies, for example. And um, one of the pieces of work I got interested in about, a, well, probably yeah, getting on for 12, 12, 15 years ago was actually looking at levels of physical inactivity. And, and when I started digging into this for, for the project I was doing, I was absolutely stunned how, we, how we've got an inactivity crisis and nobody at the time was talking about it. You know, levels of physical activity in the in the UK, it had fallen by 30% in, in, in a generation. In the US, it had fallen by something like 50% over a period of time. And, you know, essentially, we've been designing physical activity out of our lives. And the implications on health and all the sort of uh, social outcomes and for all sorts of areas, this was bad for our mental health, our physical health, our cities, our environment. And I was like, wow, for me, this was a real shock. Nobody had been talking about this. And so, I had come at it from a, actually, you know, how can we how can we change this? We, 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 we as as humans, we're designed to move. We're designed to be active. We are we are active by 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 design. 
Um, yet our whole sort of setup, had, 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 the whole way we've been living is, is, is designed that out. Um, and and that, the implications of that were re- really serious in terms of the cost of the economies, chronic health conditions, um, and just enjoyable, you know, having fun, being out and about. Kids were not, are not as active as, we've got the most inactive generation of kids in history. And we, that, is, that is bad for them. That's bad for the future. And we, we need to do something about this. So I came very much from a research perspective uh, and, and then started looking, well, what's the best way of getting people active? Well, clearly there's sport. And I, I worked in sport for a bit when I, I worked at Nike for some time. And we focused a lot there on how do we get kids to enjoy sport at an early age. Um, but I got increasingly interested in how do we design activity back into everyday life. And for me, that's actually how we shape our urban environment. Um, it isn't necessarily about doing sport. It's about walking to school, walking to the bus stop, walking to the shops, getting on a bike. And actually just how do we how do we make it just not an activity, not something we're doing, but just something that is a. Uh, that is that is just part of everyday activi- uh, every our, our everyday activities everyday everyday life yeah yeah uh, and in fact the the program at nike uh, was called design to move yes it was okay. uh, so that was a that was a program it was a global initiative yeah. that we ran looking at how what role does nike play in terms of building partnerships with everybody from the world health organization to unesco to our competitors to ngos to academics to a raft of people other businesses you know, we all have a role to play in this because essentially we're looking at systems change. There's no, there's no silver bullet to this. You know, it's about how how have we designed our lives, and to to change that, we need to look at every facet of our lives. And and I got really interested in that work with Nike for for, for five years or so on, on that. And then an opportunity came up, and and the mayor of London, the new mayor of London, he wanted to do something. And I was like. I've been telling people, or I've been making recommendations for how other people should do it. Maybe I, maybe I should give this a go myself, and uh, you know, what, uh, pra- practice what I preach. So um, I don't know. I ended up working for Zadik Khan, and for the last five years, I've had this brilliant role in, uh, you know, absolute privilege to do this role uh, of, of of trying to get London to make London an active town. Yeah, yeah, and it's a very similar journey to, to my own in, in the sense that you know I was uh, you know very early on, beginning you know thirty years ago, designing uh, environments to try to encourage people to uh, engage in a healthier, active lifestyle, mostly by building uh, wellness programs and fitness centers on corporate campuses, and yeah. but really focusing in on that you know that side of trying to encourage people to change their lifestyle behavior to get a little bit more physical activity in. Um, About 10 to 15 years ago, I started making a little bit more of a shift of how do we design our communities to encourage that natural physical activity? Yeah. So it sounds like you you did a little bit of that same sort of a shift of going from rather than, you know, how do we encourage more people to engage in physical activity and sport to Oh, uh, yeah. The built environment, the community. <laughs> How do we encourage more natural activity through for, through cycling and, and walking and other modes of, of active mobility? So... How, how many years ago was that uh, that you, you you joined the mayor? Is that about five years ago? So I guess? I've been I've been enrolled five five years now. Okay. So, it's, so and it's been one it's been one hell of a ride over the last five years. <laughs> Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so well, so yeah. for 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 those who may not know the story of London um, and in in its relationship to uh, walking and cycling. Um, just give a really quick overview of what it was like when you, you know, sort of arrived and, you know, sort of that trend of, of, of the transformations that were underway prior to you getting there and then sort of what, what accelerated. And, and it may be a little bit hard to remember back that far, even though it's not that far, but a lot has happened even in the last 24 months. <laughs> so. Exactly. It, it's sometimes hard to remember beyond uh, March, uh, March, what was it, 2020? Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago now, isn't it? But the, all the changes that have happened under COVID, and we should come on and talk to that, uh, talk about that uh, in its own right, because I think that's a, an interesting piece on, on how that's changed things change patterns of living, the ways of do it, ways of working. And, uh, and I think there's a sort of, a, it's a bit of a silver lining to the dark cloud that is COVID. Um, but pr- prior to that, and back in the pre-COVID era, um, the uh, I came in in 20, I got appointed in 2016. 
And um, the, the, the London has for years has had a wonderful public transport system. Anyone who comes to London will be familiar with the sort of, you know, with the tube and the bus network and it, 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 it functions really well. But active travel, uh, walking and cycling really hadn't been sort of taken that seriously uh, until sort of the, the previous mayor, when Boris Johnson was mayor, there were a whole series of really tragic um, collisions, people being killed on, on the roads. And, and he came under huge pressure to actually look at, well, actually, we need to, we need, we need to provide decent cycle infrastructure for people. People are, are cycling in London, but it, is, it, it isn't safe and, and people are getting hurt. And, and that sparked, I think, at the beginning of a change. So in the last period of the previous administration, there were a few cycle, a really decent, proper, the first sort of, I think the UK's first really decent cycle routes being being, being built. Uh, so why, when I came in, the sort of, sort of the, 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 there'd been a beginning of a shift. Um, and I suppose part of my job was to sort of try to get to the point where rather than talking about cycle routes, we're building a cycle network because routes, you know, we, we, we need the network to unlock the full potential so people can make all sorts of journeys, not just the from A to B, but to A, B, C, D and E and H, I, J, K on the way. Um, uh, so that was part of it, but also to make this actually build this in as as norm, rather than it being a novelty, building a, a, a decent cycle route uh, uh, as, a, as a novelty. So that, from, um, um, and how do we make this just business as usual for, for, for a city? How do, we, how do we make this just as part of the, the rollout of the way, the way that we live? So that was the cycling part of that. There, there, no one had really been looking at walking uh, in, in this. And obviously, a lot of people walk in London. If you, you, know, if you, if you, you listen to the Kink song, Water, you know, Waterloo Sunset, they're walking across Waterloo Bridge. You know, it's a wonderful city to walk, walk around. But there is an awful lot of, and we have a wonderful walking network. The pavements, the, the sidewalks across our city are, are phenomenal. And you can explore the brilliant historic city in all sorts of ways by, by foot. But there are, you know, there are, there is so much more we can do to 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 make that safer, more appealing, allow it, you know, allow people to move around when they're pushing a buggy or if they've got a mobility aid. You know, how do, how do we make this? So, so my job came in as sort of the, it was the cusp of a change. But I, I felt my role was really to one to consolidate to make it. We're not just building a couple of cycle routes. Actually, what we're doing is changing a city. Yeah, and we're changing a city, and we're making that normal. And so, Sadiq yeah. came in with this vision for you know transport. We we need to do this. Uh, when when Sadiq came in, and when we came into came into started work, about sixty three percent of the journeys in London were walking, cycling, and public transport. Yeah. Sadiq set the aim in his transport strategy to shift from sixty three percent to eighty percent. Now that's a massive change. Yeah, that is yeah. that is shifting journeys from from cars to walking cycling and public transport and he put that approach at the very heart of his transport strategy so if you skip on to the, the next picture you can see what some of the streets of london were like this is in uh, in in walthamstow in in, in a, it's a sort of out it's sort of on the on the sort of the inner outer london border um and there's, there's that slide really shows um you know the previous one with all the cars that's what the street was like with all the cars um you know, we, we with the part of the scheme that changed things, it was all about, well, how do we shift people in these cars to make these streets more conducive for people? Putting right. people at the very heart of this. And the next street's exactly the same street, yep, but the transformation that happened. And, and obviously, more people are walking, more people are cycling. That's, that's the bread and butter. What's interesting in this is that for the first time in living memory, there's no empty shop in that street. Right, it's a high right. street, yeah? yeah? There are no empty businesses. This is good for business. You get more people walking, you get more people cycling. It increases footfall. It increases the amount of things. And suddenly, if you, it's logical, really, isn't it, John? You know, so right. you, you, you create a space that's nice for people. People enjoy spending time in it. And if you're yeah. spending time in it, rather than driving through it, you might stop and buy a coffee. You might pick up some, you know, maybe have some food on the way home. Or you see your friends. You go for a drink. You have a pint. Or whatever it is, you know, you want to spend time in those nice spaces. And so that, for me, is sort of simple. That, that's the change we want to see. So it started at a, at a very strategic level and not just, um, we, we, we banned this under the healthy streets 
perspective. So we right. have, you know, indicators. We, we we need to make our streets healthy. We need to make them streets for people, places people want to relax and spend time in. And that model was not only the sort of the core of our transport strategy, but we also ended up building it. It's core of our planning policy and, and the environment strategy. It spans all the different uh, uh, sort of across the di- across the different departments because this goes way beyond transport. This is health. This is environment in terms of cleaner air. This is business. This is uh, this is community cohesion. And you know, we know that if you have a walkable neighbourhood, you know, you get a, up to eighty percent more social capital in a place where people bump into their neighbours. They say hi. They they hang out. They they you know they have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee. You know, and that's the sort of it, 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 success. It breeds success in this space. So it's a it's a cross. It's, although it's sort of a transport. I sit within the transport sort of infrastructure within London. The whole approach is integrated across all our mayoral policies as a as a priority. Right. Yeah. I want to go back to uh, the the previous two photos. And uh, for the listening audience, I'll try to describe uh, what we're looking at here. Um, So this particular street, I mean, in this first image, I mean, this is just choke full of cars. You can see a little bit of the pavement, the the sidewalk um, off to the side there, but very, very constrained and feels constrained because of the amount of, of cars. You've got two lanes of motor vehicles and it looks like they're just stuck there. <laughs> it looks like gridlock. Yeah, and then yeah. the the second image, I mean, the, the, the motor vehicles are completely removed from the space. Um, I don't know if that's a permanent situation or if it, or, or if this would be considered, you know, like a, a, a wooner for shared it's, space. Um, you can I, still let uh, buses can still go through there. So it's really okay. important for me that public transport features in this because it's, it provides an alternative. It's uh, it, it's sustainable. It's it's good for the environment yeah. as well. And, uh, and and so we need to make sure. So this is an example where buses can come through here. But really, you, as you said, this picture is people sitting out. They're yeah. having, you know, there's a cafe. There's cafe. There are people sitting around there, wandering down. Couples walking down the street. Uh, you know, group families chatting. Um, you know, it's it's what I, I I feel this is what makes a, a street appealing. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it, it reinforces the fact that. Um, historically, streets were bu- built for people. Streets were built yeah. as a platform for building wealth and bringing people together. Um, what is the the era of of this street? I mean, when were were likely the, these buildings built? So this would have been probably. So this it, this is an area called Waltham Forest, uh, Walthamstow. These I would have. I'm not an architectural historian, but yeah. I, if I was going to guess, I'd put around 1900, maybe okay. 90, yeah, sort of late, yeah, 1900, maybe yeah. 1910. But sort of yeah, this was a time when, it, it, as you said, these weren't designed for cars. Cars, right. you know, there weren't there weren't cars on London streets at this point. There weren't like horses yeah. and carts, yeah, but they would have been designed for people. Yeah. And I think you know part of the problem here is that for decades. Uh, for the last sort of 80, 90 years, our cities have been transformed, you know, in the yeah. UK anyway. Um, I've been transformed for, uh, from from cities for people to cities of car, and we're sort of trying to move that back a bit. Other yeah, cities I mean, elsewhere in the world Because, yeah, if you, if you think of it, this was the retrofit of, you know, because when it was first built, it probably looked more like this, where it was multimodal, and more than likely there were horse carriages coming through here. Uh, and in the early days of the automobiles, so you probably had some of, you know, the, the slower-moving automobiles yeah. that, you know, were there. Then it got transformed into... And and this is the, the challenge that we have with many cities around many of the older cities in Europe, uh, some of the older cities here in North America and other locations around the, the world, is that those historic streets, those historic places, were then transformed into autocentric spaces, which is really a travesty when you think of it. Because when yeah. you get to the, the, the benefits of having these healthy streets where, you know, it's like it's easy to cross. There's all these things that are there. It's it's integrated around um, what works for people versus what works for cars of moving more vehicles through space in a given period of time. Yeah. Definitely, and you know, but I th- but I think what's also interesting is it's not just the cities that have been transformed in this period. It's yeah. our it's society's mentality. You right. know. 
throughout this period, it's it's not just that we've built our we've transformed our streets or we've built our towns and cities to to around the car. Right. Um, We've psychologically just accepted, you know, billions and billions of dollars have been spent on marketing the automobile, the sort of soft power of the sort of the road trip, this freedom, the right to, 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 to go. This is a deep rooted piece that sits within our society. And, and it's, and it's, and it's terrible. It's bad for us. I'm, I'm not anti car. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that what we need to do is ban all cars. But there's so many, um, you know, short journeys. I'll give you an example in, in, in London every morning. 250,000 car journeys are just associated with the school run, you know, mm-hmm. burying right. kids to school. Now, most of those are local journeys. You know, a third of, of, of millions of car journeys are under two kilometers, a couple of miles, you know, a mile, a mile and a half. You know, now some of those, if you're carrying really big, big luggage or you've got a disability right. or if you're, you know, you're, you're moving, I don't know, paving slabs from the, from the, from the, from the, from the, from the sort of uh, landscaping store and the hardware store to your house, you know, a car would be useful. My point is that there's so many of those journeys that could be switched. And part yeah. of this whole approach is let's look at those switchable trips. We're not being anti-car, it's, that it's switchable trips. And yeah. so there's part of this is transport and transforming the roads. Now, from a cycling perspective, there are two tools in our sort of book, in our in our in our in our armory that we've we've been using part of that if you go to the previous slide actually um you can see there's i think there's myself and uh, sadiq uh, so this is me and the mayor on a and then it's a bit of a blurred picture but it's me and the mayor cycled on a new protected se- segregated uh protected cycle track so where yeah. we've got busy roads you need to put in those protected tracks i think you know this is this is common sense uh and you know to make them safe but the other approach we can take is also then looking at some of the quieter streets. And this right. is when I come back to building a network. It's like, well, we've got quieter streets, but how do we make sure they're quiet? So if you go on to the next slide, this is a screen grab from Google and previous to um, to, uh, to, to starting. And this was a sort of a bit of a rat run for taxis right. and for cars cutting through a sort of small streets. And it was busy. It was unpleasant. It's narrow. And these people were sort of, you know, trying to avoid the main roads and wiggling through. And then what we did was quite simply put in a the simple on the simple a simple single bollard and a safe crossing, transform that for people walking and for people cycling. It's now a safe cycle route, um, and and you know that's you don't need to put in protected cycle routes in some of these spaces. You can filter it. It can be quieter roads uh, so that there are things. So I've really had to sort of come with it, come to this that you need to make sure that whatever you're doing has got to be good quality. Doesn't need to all be protected cycle routes because we need the freight. We need, you know, our stores, our shops, our restaurants need supplies. People need to be able. To, you know, we've got construction projects. We need our roads to need, need need our roads to work, but we also need those spaces to be safe for, for people to cycle. So you need a a divert, you know a diff, different plans, and it's and it's working in London. That's the, that's the that's the cool thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that too about the 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 balance of both the protected and separated infrastructure, as well as just the quieter street infrastructure. I try to remind folks on the podcast here frequently that uh, even the Dutch net- network is about 70% shared space network. Yeah. It's the Feetstraats, it's the, the quieter streets. And uh, obviously the protected and separated infrastructure gets all the press because it is quite yeah. impressive. But in reality, uh, the vast majority of the network is, is actually some form of shared space. And so you need that traffic calming aspect of it. And this is a wonderful, beautiful example of uh, traffic calming and diverters uh, to be able to allow more people to go through there. So when we talk about traffic calming and, and traffic diversion, we're really talking about <laughs> motor vehicle traffic. We're actually yeah. able to, to to be able to accommodate even more people who, but through walking and cycling and uh, you know mobility devices, wheelchairs, things of that nature in in a facility like this. Yeah, I definitely I completely agree. You know, I think that, that, that you've got to. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to sort of, you've got to focus on the road that you've got, and you need that, that the variety of things. So it's like, well, rather than saying I need a, a, a bike route that is all going to be protected all the way along, it's like, well, what's the most sensible route for that, you know, for that 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 particular journey, and then what makes the most sense with the infrastructure that you've got. I think the key thing is, and and I, I did, um, I, um, I did one of the things I I learned was. 
to build the cycle network we need in London. So there is a, you know, when you're starting, I came in and there were 50 kilometers of protected cycle uh, tracks in, in London. You know, there's not much given the size of the city. Uh, and so, so where, do, where do you start? Where do you prioritize? And I needed a system to go, right, actually, we need to prioritize these routes. I need to be able to say, yes, we're going to do these. But I also need to be able to say, no, sorry, we're not going to do that first. We're going to prioritize the limited resources on these. So the team did a brilliant job pulling together population data, uh, cycle count data, beginning to look at what journeys were happening in terms of public transport, in terms of uh, in terms of cars, uh, looking at new builds, where the new housing would be, and sort of begin to pull together what we call the strategic cycling analysis, which is essentially our our network plan right. of saying, right, these are these are the these are the top potential connections. If you build this, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, you're yeah. going to get the most people cycling, and that is the the, the approach that we we've taken. The, the map that you would see here is very much, it's lines, uh, the various different colored lines scattered all over, over London. Um, what they are not, the way I've done this is saying, well, these are sort of point to point, rather than saying this is the, the road that this route will be on. No, what I want is the journeys from this town center to this town center, or this part of London mm -hmm. to the center, or this, this, this transport hub to another transport hub. And then you begin to look at, well, if that's the priority connection we need, what is the mo what's the best route for that? Yeah, there's always a you've got to balance it out. What, what how do we make sure it's direct? How do we make and sometimes that will be a protected cycle route. Sometimes that will be a quieter back street, and we need to make sure they're quieter back streets. Right. But that's the that's you know we, we need a pragmatic, really clear, open, transparent, data led approach to uh, to doing to, do, to doing this. So that was the the sort of first innovation that we had was really to use that data as the sort of setting out. Well, where, where, what, what routes do we want and, and how should we prioritize them? Yeah, yeah. Is there a, an accommodation from, uh, from a, a, the prioritization uh, perspective for um, also looking at which routes or uh, ability to, to get from point A to point B in these priorities that are higher comfort than others. And where I'm heading with this is that, especially in North America, uh, the cycle networks oftentimes gravitate towards those major streets, which then make it that much more important that they are the the more protected and more segregated types of facilities, which amps up the cost dramatically, um, yeah. they have to be there. It eventually has to be there. But then that political fight gets that much harder, as well as the, the financing becomes that much more difficult. Um, and the yeah, the political fight. I'm also now thinking yeah, the resistance too, especially if it means yeah. the sacrifice of any parking and or travel lanes for motor vehicles. It, it's difficult. But even once it's in, it may not be high comfort just because there's yeah. still motor vehicles there. There's lots of driveway cuts. There's lots of these other things. Is there a, a, a mechanism for also prioritizing and or identifying what's higher comfort? Because sometimes it could be those lesser traveled areas that are much higher comfort. So what we did was uh, actually if we click onto the, the next the, the next slide. Um, what we did was bring in a series of quality criteria. Now the key one is the total volume of motor traffic. Now if it is right. really busy, a busy street needs protection. Yeah, yeah, and we define what that is. But then there are other factors like the speed of that traffic, the width right. of the street, you know, how much curbside activity. Are there always people coming in and out? As you said, the driveways coming over it, interactions. You know, what sort of traffic is there? Is there a um, is there a factory or a refuge dump at the end of the road where you've got HGVs coming down or or, or right. and you know what what's the what the all the turning all the turning movements? If there are a lot of turning movements, that's going to have an impact. So. Those quality criteria for me were like, right, if we're going to say something is a cycle route, it's got to meet the defined parameters of these cycle, uh, of these of these quality criteria. Because otherwise what we found was people were putting in cycle routes that really, for me, I, you know, I, what my, my test for this is, will my, will my kids cycle on it? Right. Yeah, or would I feel, actually my kids would cycle most places, would I feel comfortable <laughs> with my kids cycling? Right. Probably a better way of looking at it, yeah. Um, so, so I think there's a sort of informal picture, and, and you're exactly right. And now, there are some, there are some protected bike lanes that we've got that I think are absolutely superb, but they do not suit all cyclists. And, right. I, and I think this comes back to um, what we're trying to achieve here. 
I want two things out of this. I want to make it safer for people who are already cycling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. That's that goes without saying. Got to be the priority safety. But the key thing that's actually going to change the uh, the ch- change the city and change people's health, their well being, and all the other benefits are thinking about those people who aren't cycling and yeah. getting them to cycle. Yeah. yeah. Now. Where you've got a big protected bike lane like the one in this, it's, it's great for those existing cyclists. But for some people, actually, fast cyclists are often as, uh, as intimidating as, some, as, as cars yeah. in, in some cases. Yeah. And so what, we find, what we're finding in some of the data is the newer cyclists are actually preferring to be on the quieter roads yeah. Yeah, uh, in those residential neighborhoods. And it also ties into, well, what sort of journeys are we doing? Yeah. And historically, the lanes that we've had in London are all coming into the center. It's that very much that sort of, was it Hoyt model of Chicago back in the day, where it's sort of the radial routes coming out right. from the, the center. And, you know, everybody cycling into the center of the city as a commuter cyclist. But actually, a lot of the local journeys are not radial. They're orbital or they're within the local neighborhoods. And so we need to accommodate those to allow people to think, well, actually, I could take my bike to do that rather than driving the car. That helps reduce congestion. It helps improve the environment. And it helps those uh, it helps those people feel, you know, those, the health and well-being of those people and those, those neighborhoods. So, you know, there's... I'm a great believer in sort of different strokes for different folks. But the key thing is very much, you know, how do we make this? I always use the term enabling. How do we enable right. more people to cycle? I'm not about encouraging people. You know, we're enabling people. How do we just make it intuitive? Well, why wouldn't I cycle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and one, the wonderful thing about that, that, uh, that word enabling is there's a lot of things that are inferred in that, including a safe and inviting uh, facility that, yeah. you know, it's, it's like we're not daring you. You know, we're not yeah. saying it is possible. We're like we're truly creating an inviting environment that enables you to make this a, a practical and pragmatic choice. The reason why I like this photo is it, it gives a little bit of a dichotomy of being able to talk about how uh, I think London is is like many North American cities and, and as well as many cities uh, down under like in, in Australia and New Zealand right now are in this stage where we're, we're, we're creating safer uh, facilities and networks and people are, are doing it at a greater level. But then you have sort of this mashup between the people who are those diehard folks that are, you know, have clip in shoes and they're wearing yeah. Lycra and, you know, they they're they're maybe doing long journeys or fast journeys and there's speed yeah. that just oozes out of them. But then you also have, you know, a few people here that are dressed in just normal clothes and they're more relaxed and they're just kind of teetering along at a, at a much more um upright leisurely pace that is more similar to when we look at uh, you know other communities and other societies that have really truly adopted cycling for for everyday use it's it's more relaxed it's it's not a race exactly and you know you look at copenhagen or if you look at amsterdam or yeah. utrecht or Delft or any of these cities where really yeah. you know but where you think well, actually these people have cracked it you know but this is this is a cycling city um that's exactly right and i you know, I, I, I've lived in London for 20 odd years now. Um, and, you know, when 20 odd years ago, you had to be aggressive as a cyclist because the roads were aggressive. Yep. And so therefore people got into the frame of mind that this is this this was a, you know, it, it was an aggressive environment. People are, it was white knuckle stuff yep, to, to yeah. sort of to, to do that. I, I don't want this to be a white knuckle ride. Yeah. What yeah. I want is it to people, to, I want my parents to be happy poodling about yeah i need i want my you know i want my my 13 year old son to be happy to cycle to school i want my 11 year old daughter to be able to, to to cycle to the park it's 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 that that's so important and i think you know the there are all sorts of things that need to happen is to make a town active but the, the, the fundamental the underpinning piece is people people being safe but people feeling safe and those are those are connected things but they're not always the same yeah, yeah. I pulled up this uh, photo because you just mentioned the white knuckle experience of cycling. So let's talk a little bit about walking, too, and the ability to transform the built environment so that it, it does, you know, bring the pedestrian a little bit further along in terms of feeling comfortable in their environment. Talk about what's going on in this photo and, and why this is significant. 
So this is a zebra crossing. Uh, this is a um, you know we we it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pedestrian priority crossing across the across. The, so when someone is uh, when someone is ready to walk onto this, the cars must stop. Um, and I for me, I think that this this this. How do we, you know, far too long, the pedestrian has been so far down the pecking order in the city. Yeah. And 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 nobody really talked about walking. The, sort of the term pedestrian sounds dull. You know, right. oh, that's very pedestrian. <laughs> exactly. it's by definition, it's, oh, that's very pedestrian. It's boring. Yeah. Actually, we need to be making walking sexy. You know, yeah. it's it, it's a great way of getting around, you know. If, if 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 you walk for I can't remember if twenty minutes a day of walking, you're going to reduce all cause mortality by twenty percent. Now, if I if I invented a drug as good as that, I'd have Nobel prizes up to my armpits. Yep. Well, okay, so um, you just said, said something interesting there. That twenty minutes a day, that's actually in the plan, right? Yes. So yeah. we. This is exactly why we built this in. So part of our, our one of our targets is to get all London. Now it doesn't need to be twenty minutes at one time. Right. Yeah. Two ten minute walks is great. Yeah. Yeah. But we need to make sure that you know for some people. If you click onto the next slide, um, this is this is this is, this is um, for for me. I'm what am I? I'm in my mid forties. I'm reasonably fit. I can walk down a, 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 a pavement no problem whatsoever. But this road shows a busy uh, residential street with a lot of traffic moving down it. But it's also got people parking on the pavements. Uh, it's got street trees, narrow footways, and it's the bin day. So you can see some of the bins, the refuge bins uh, are out on the street. It's basically somebody, an obstacle course. <laughs> if you're pushing a buggy with your kid, you know, with a baby down there, or, you know, a double buggy. Even what, I remember when I was pushing a double buggy and my kids around, you know, this would have been, it would have been impossible. Right, if you've right. got a mobility aid uh, yeah. and you can't walk and you're feeling, but even if you're just not that confident, crossing this road would be, is so difficult. I spoke to a lady who lived in one of these houses and she had, uh, she got, got a bit older, lost some of her mobility, lost some of her confidence. The impact of this street meant that she was no longer crossing the road to get to the local park, which must have been about 300 meters up the road. Yep. The impact of that meant that she wasn't seeing her friends. She was beginning to get cut off. She was becoming isolated. That had an impact on her mental health, her physical health. These things spiral. Yeah. Right. And it's as simple as making sure that the street is walkable yep, for all, for everybody. Yeah. And that there's enough space and time for people to cross the roads. And that's why the crossings are so important. So since 2016, I think we've brought in something like, um, if I can up my notes, something like 700 new crossings in, in London mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and transforming junctions. But we have, you know, this is it's the basic piece here of actually making the city city walkable and feel, making it make walkable for everybody. Please tell me there's a better picture. Uh, the next picture is this transformation. No, no! this one isn't. This one is. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right. You know, we talked about this earlier. The, the pictures are so key, and I, I know a lot yeah. of people will be listening to this on the uh, on, on on just audio. Yeah. Um, but I remember when you know, I, 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 I I'm not an engineer by training, but I think storytelling is an absolutely key part of this. And you know, we this isn't just about changing the streets. This is about bringing people with us on, on, on this journey and seeing why they need this so that people demand this, people yeah. ask for this. And, you know, I remember coming into the, the job and uh, there was, I, I said, what we need are before and after pictures. Yeah, 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 because yeah. Once, you see a, once you see a street, yeah, no matter how good it is, it's just a street, but you kind of need to see what happened before and then see what happened afterwards. And uh, yeah. anyway, the brilliant people that I worked with went out and took a load of pictures. Yeah. And each picture was actually each picture was brilliant. It showed all the detail of the lines and the and the and the and the change in the new curbs and everything else. But there wasn't a single person on the on the street. And and yeah. it, sometimes the thing when you've got engineers looking at, at this, they will look at it from an engineering perspective. And I'm like, right. what we need to do is motivate people. This is to show that these are places for people. But all these pictures have got no people in. So we need before yeah. and yeah. after. But yeah. we want after with people being vibrant and living in the place. Yeah, it's it's kind of the joke too of of folks that are like in this realm where 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 wonks about it, and so we'll go out, we'll take pictures of of infrastructure, and uh, and oftentimes we'll take a picture of like a really cool protected intersection or protected bikeway, yeah. and if we happen to catch it without anybody in it, the comment is, well, where are all the people now? It's like, oh, exactly. yeah. oh, you built it's an like, empty bikeway. <laughs> Oops, but you know, we we just love the infrastructure so much that we don't even think. Oh, that's right. Make sure there's people too. Okay, so we we uh, got I have to this. I become a curb nerd in, in, the, oh, in yeah, London. They are called yeah. curb nerds. So you know, I've, yeah. I've become a curb nerd. During this piece. So we uh, we 
we've tripped our way into this photograph. So why don't you describe what's going on in this in this picture? So, uh, so a, a bit of background before we talk about the p- picture. The picture sure. itself is of a bike hub. It's at a station. It's a bike parking. It's secure bike parking. It's opened up. You can there's some balloons there. It's the sort of you know one of those those cliched let's cut the ribbon of a new bit of uh, infrastructure piece. But the key right. thing is that it's at a it's it's not in central London. It's out of London and it allows people to. Um, Park their bike securely. In fact, it opened and it got so busy that we had to ex- build an extension because it was uh, there was so much heavy demand for it. Um, but I think for me, this is really important. That what I'm what we're not doing is you know, a city the size of London. There are some people, as you said, who will cycle a long way and cycle right. fast and, and and really sort of get into this in a big way. But actually, I think most people break down their, their journeys into stages. So this is right. about how I think the real win will be is where we begin to uh, integrating active travel and into into the public transport network. Yeah. Ah, so that people okay. begin to so that people are cycling that first journey. It might be maybe right. a couple a kilometer or two to the train station, jump on the train into town, go to work or whatever you're doing, go to see your friends, go out for dinner, come back, jump on the secure place, park your bike. Uh, and move on. So, since we've come in, I think we've built something like twenty-eight uh, since twenty sixteen or since I started twenty-eight thousand uh, bike parking spaces. Um, and I think, you know, integrating the public transport is essential um, yeah, yeah. For, for for this. Um, but bike parking is also something that is often overlooked, um, both at you know in places of talking to developers to um, or people who landlords. Um, People in, in places of work, secure bike parking, absolutely essential to enabling that shift. Yeah. But yeah. Also, also, where do people park their bikes at home? I think this is often overlooked. You know, right. the, the London terraced houses in London, there's not a lot of space. But, you know, people don't have tend not to have garages. They weren't built. The city wasn't built when cars were prevalent. We don't right, have right. garages. Yeah. yeah. It's it and, and and so therefore you know you go into most of the houses I've lived in there's sort of three bikes jammed down this sort of corridor and the stairway where you're constantly tripping over bits of bike and kids bike and bike helmet and and all people live in flats and then carrying a a, a bike that you're up twenty sort of twenty floors up to the top is is a pain particularly if you've got an e-bike or something. So bike parking in residential areas, I think, is a particular ba- barrier here. So we've introduced a system of putting bike hangers. So you take out a car parking space, you put in a bike hanger, it's secure, there's six, six bikes per hanger, uh, and we're rolling them out across the city as well. So it's sort of, you need the infrastructure, but then you need the supporting infrastructure to allow to allow people to really use it. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, this, is, this reminded me a lot of uh, the uh, bike facilities at uh, many of the the train stations uh, throughout the Netherlands and that whole incredible uh, synergistic relationship that exists between the bike and the train and transit uh, stops uh, in, in the Netherlands. It's it's one of the, the un, unsung uh, brilliant <laughs> strategies that make it all work. You've got the, the yeah. cycle network, but then you also have that ability so that you can do mode pairing so that you're able to you know be able to couple those journeys now in the netherlands they now, also now have, i wish sure i yeah. wish this this so i think maybe the angle of this photo is, yeah. is misleading uh in the fact that this is not at the same scale of, of some of those wonderful oh yeah no no they're, they're massive so, yeah but it, yeah. it's so impressive what they yeah. have um but i yeah. totally agree with you that yeah. you know that that is the I think that's one of the holy grail here. It's it's, it's integrating yeah. the active travel with the right. with the public transport to provide a a, a whole series of options and a, 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 a and thinking of the journey not just as a sort of gate line to gate line, but right. from the into, from the customer perspective, from yeah. home to destination, and all of that together is, is is quite a shift for a lot of transport engineers and planners. Absolutely, and and, and the catchment area is just is that much broader when you're able to um, you know encourage people to jump on the that first and last trip of of being on a bike because you've got a a ninefold larger catchment area compared to if it's just a walking journey. And so it really the empowerment of connecting people through transit to, to many more in destinations and starting destinations is, is that much more powerful when you have strategically placed high quality, safe, convenient, comfortable um, parking facilities. Now, the Netherlands also, their transit system has um, in, in the last 10 years really ramped up their 
public uh, or, or the integration of the bike sharing system with the Ove Feats uh, program. Uh, do you all have something similar to that uh, uh, integrated with transit so that somebody, if their first journey is on their private bike to a faci- facility such as this, at the other end, uh, is there an ability to jump on a shared bike system or scheme? Yeah, so for the last 10 years, we've had uh, the Santander cycle system, of, well, uh, colloquially sometimes known as Boris Bikes, and the, the, after the name of the previous uh, mayor and prime minister. I prefer Wheels Wheels these days. Oh, yeah, definitely, a, yeah. A, yeah. A, Gotta a, own it. Or, or, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, they, so in, largely in central London or central and inner London, uh, that is a dock bike system that um, that we with, that we've got it, which exactly that purpose, um, so that people can can use that shared facilities. In parts of outer London, what we're seeing is a sort of prevalence of dockless, uh, elect- uh, largely electric bikes coming out, and right. some of the new technologies pro you know create opportunities, but also challenges. But the, the the system that we've got in central London, you know, we just last year we last year, and this comes a bit. We, we can talk about COVID uh, later on, but um. The, the last year, I think I get a I get an email every Monday on how the on how the week's gone from the cycle season, and virtually every week it was breaking records. We had over eleven million hires last last year. It's just astonishing how popular the the the, the shared bikes became, and it, it just became you know it's become sim it's become another sim just like the red London bus. You're seeing you know the, my kids were watching some music video with someone who was number one in the charts and he was riding around on one of these bikes and it's like wow this has become ubiquitous it's a right, symbol yeah. of london and it's wonderful yeah 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 now you mentioned your kids so i'm going to pull up uh, this isn't necessarily a, a picture of your kids but it's a picture no. of kids <laughs> saying thank you for uh, the bike lanes what, what's the story behind this so this is a wonderful. This is wonderful. This is up in uh, in Enfield, which is out of London. They've come br- they've come together and built a brilliant um, uh, sort of the beginning to build a brilliant network work out there. And but they, you know, it central. You know, you talk, touched on this earlier on that there can be backlash against taking space away from parking, from uh, taking out lanes for for traveling. And and it's and 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 those politicians that push that forward in the local area, those councillors. Get a lot of um, get a, get get an awful lot of uh, quite angry and passionate uh, sort of uh, um, uh, a, a, a backlash against some of these things. And one of the things I say to so many people is, we've got to celebrate the successes. You know, this is a this is a this is a movement. We need to we need to keep people motivated. Right. And the campaigning communities, for me, form. You know, I always talk about their four pillars to change here. One of them is the political vision and that, 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 that we need to make the change, which London's got with our mayor and many other cities have, and that funding comes with that and that sort of thing. So the political vision is one thing. Data is number two. We, you know, I've talked a bit about the data piece that of how we, um, you know, how, and how we inform and how we prioritize, how we tell the stories and the data that's coming in. The third piece is the technical expertise, the brilliant people who come up with like, how on earth do we fit a bike lane in here? What's, right. you know, we talked a bit about being the curb nerd and looking at the wonderful, right. you know, what angles that at and does it work? Is it safe? Does it work? How does it work with the signals? But the, third, the fourth pillar and the sort of fourth leg of this table for me is about campaigning communities. It's, right. it's about having the, the, the communities themselves, people, people asking for this, people writing emails, people school kids talking about it so that the conversation you know the, my, one of the things i've loved here was the conversation around the dinner table at home moved from oh bike lanes are causing pollution to actually i want to be riding my bike to school and that changes the conversation it's so much so and so i've always you know I, I, it, london's very lucky we've got a really passionate campaign groups for cyc- london cyclists living streets the camp- pedestrian and walk- walking groups People, people really, really sort of give up an awful lot of time and energy to do this. And, 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 and it's vital. The change only happens with those four pillars. Uh, right. uh, and, and, and those campaigning communities are so important. And to sustain that, you need to celebrate the successes. And I was delighted to come and open these cycle lanes with these kids here. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because it, it, it does. You, you have to have all of these uh, different, uh, different areas uh, you're calling them for pillars. And, and, uh, I think it's absolutely critical. And I try to remind folks that yes, it, good leadership, you know, is, is incredibly, uh, important. And oftentimes, you know, we, 
you know, look wistfully towards, you know, the, the, you know, the, the leadership that's being shown in Paris right now and, and obviously uh, currently happening now in, in London. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You do need to have that um, support from the community. You need to have the, the, you know, because they, whether you're talking about bold moves that are being done from the politicians or from city staff trying to, to you know, move for, change forward, uh, there is going to be that backlash. And so making sure that, you know, there is that backstop of, you know, really overwhelming community support that can really help counter the fact that, yes, there's going to be some very vocal minorities and some of them may be powerful because they may have powerful, you know, corporate interests to try to keep the status quo of car dependency moving forward. Uh, it, it's so important to have this. And so I, I love this photo. I love the fact that it is part of that celebrating these wins because it is imp incredibly important to, to keep that momentum going and grow the awareness uh, within communities. Because, and, and, and quite frankly, that's a big part of what the Active Towns channel is all about, is trying to tell these success stories so that we can you know, say, hey, this is possible. Yeah. And, and it works. And, and, you know, and I say to everybody, it's like, even if something isn't perfect, right. write to your local council and say, look, I, I love this. This could be improved this way and this way. But um, what we really need to, as you said, there are, there, are, there are often very vocal minorities against some of the changes that need to happen in cities to enable more people to, to, to choose sustainable modes of travel. Um, those vocal minorities are never shy in writing to their members of parliament, right. their senators, their their councillors. And what we need to make sure is that even if we don't think something is perfect, we need to say, look, thank you for doing this. This could be improved next time, do X, Y, and Z. But there needs to be that, that we need to be critical friends when people are making brave political choices. They might not always get it perfect, but we need to be supporting them because if they feel that, oh, I've taken all, I've expended all this political capital delivering the bike lane, Right. And now the people who, the, you know, the corporate interests or whoever, the antis are still anti. God, even the cyclists don't think, you know, this, they say we need right. to be, be telling a positive story. I'm not, I'm not saying that we need to tolerate poor infrastructure, but right. I'm saying we need, to, we need to bring people along with us on this because it is a, it's, it, it's, 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 it, people need to be hearing that this is things that communities want. These are the things that are, that are vote winners. And time and time again, the electoral politics show that people want this stuff. But who does not? Who who does who does not want their kids to breathe clean air? You right, know, right. who does not want their kids to be able to walk to school without the threat of being hit by a truck? You know, these are this is these are fundamental human rights, and uh, and and rightly so. They're vote win winners. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, earlier you you mentioned uh, the pandemic, and uh, so uh, about. Four years uh, after coming into office, and you guys are moving along, and, and things are moving and shaking, and then 2020 happens, and then along comes a global Bang. pandemic. Bam! Yeah. Walk us through what happened uh, for, for you all in the context of, of, of your day to day. And uh, it, it's been a recurring uh, topic. I launched this podcast during just, just immediately before the lockdown. And so in the early episodes, uh, a lot of it was observing the, it, the early impacts. Now we're obviously past, uh, you know, we're two years plus in, uh, where are you guys at now and, and what sort of happened in the early stages? Yeah. So we were in the run-up to election. So the mayor was mm -hmm. we were in March when COVID hit. Uh, you know, we were about to go into what's the pre-election period, um, where the sort of campaigning period happens up until May, and the, then the election was cancelled. So, you know, COVID was a very, very dark time for a lot of Londoners. That there was a, people experienced a lot of grief, a lot of loss, illness, suffering, yeah. a huge amount of stress, anxiety. It was very, very difficult. It was a dark time. But one of the one of the silver linings of that period was that during the lockdowns that we had, there were suddenly fewer cars on the streets. Yeah, and the transformation. This the picture we've got up on the screen at the moment is behind the Treasury. It's just near Buckingham Palace. It's a busy, usually a busy road of cars, and it shows a load of kids and a family cycling right. up and down. Now this was echoed in every neighbourhood across the city. Suddenly, right. when cars weren't there. People felt safe to walk their dogs, to go for a run, to bounce a basketball, to, 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 to cycle in their, their local areas. 
and it was remarkable. The other thing that happened was during the lockdown, if you click onto the next slide, our, our underground system, our tube, was empty. We, we were operating, you know, we had to keep the transport system running because the key workers, doctors, people who had to get to the, the, elect, the guy who keep the power running had to get to work. But we were operating at about 5% of, um, of, of, of lockdown, of, 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 previous, of, previous, uh, of, of previous figures. So the tube system was empty. Um, but I saw, they, we suddenly started looking, we, social distancing was the, was, was, you know, everybody was thinking two meters apart and this sort of thing. And we're like, hang on, if we go back and the, and the transport system gets busier uh, and we do socially distancing, there is not the capacity to travel, move people around. And so if you go to the next slide, this, this slide is a graph that shows the two peaks of transport in, on, the, on the underground in London. And they're two peaks, really high peaks, and then there are a couple of lines below it. It shows network per capacity um, when you've got social distancing of one meter, two meters, uh, in, 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 and, and the service levels were able to run because our staff were getting ill at this point too. Right. And it was like, oh, my God, we won't have the capacity. So if we can't travel by underground, where, where are people going to go? And if you go on to the next slide, they, you know, they, they – the, the, the alternative would be that people ended up would end up driving, and that would lead right. to gridlock. That means it would be bad for the city. But my God, the last thing you need in a respiratory disease pandemic is a load of toxic air pollution. Yeah, and it's I, a, lo I love and, this and particular me, choice on the photo because a, it yeah, is a, it gives you the, there is the, a, na the, a Range Rover, <laughs> a na sorry, a nameless uh, sports utility vehicle uh, jammed in traffic. Pump belching out some ghastly yes. noxious fumes and it, it does not look an appealing image and this is yeah. what we want to avoid by the way uh, exactly. you know this yes. is a and so um so we very quickly sort of thought actually you know we need to do something about this and so there are you know what 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 do we need we need very we, like so many other cities around we need to rapidly roll out temporary infrastructure so that people can safely cycle and make the space for them uh, yeah. we re-looked at our the next page the next slide we looked we looked at our data we came up with an emergency map, and then we launched our street space program, which was our emergency rollout of temporary materials. Um, this consisted of a, couple, a few things. Partly, it was making the pavements wider so that people could use the shops, people could walk safely, and, and then see the next page slide down. This is a really busy transport hub at Brixton in South London, and we took out a lane of traffic, put in a uh, in, in, in a wider wider pavement, and people. People, people loved it. The next, you know, but there was also main roads like the next one, which is Park Lane, famous. Oh no, sorry, this is a, this isn't. This is um Broadway Market. This is in Hackney. This is a uh, lovely. Well, it is now, but at the time, this is a this sort of little high street uh, of shops and cafes and uh, and and a really nice area. But it gets busy, and this is shows a, a, a truck and a van and a load of cars trying to get on. That was closed uh, for to traffic. You could get access, so all the shops could get deliveries, but it was closed traffic. Totally transformed the neighborhood during COVID. These shops were busy. People were using them, but there was the space. This shows completely no cars. A mum talking with a push chair, but some a little kid on their bike, people walking in the street. But the key thing was the space to allow people to go to their local shops safely, not feeling intimidated. So that right. you know, we, we had to keep the retail going, and uh, and and so many businesses survived on it. And this scheme here has been is being made permanent, uh, okay. and is in as and it's, it's been one of those things. Brilliant. The next slide is a, I think, I hope, if I've got the right order here. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is Park Lane. You know, which was a well, this is four lane motorways for some reason running through the center of our city. You know, we, we took out like so many other areas. We took out a lane of traffic, put in a cycle lane. Next slide. And you can see people enjoying it. You know, it's cheap. It's cheerful. It's plastic bollards and, and things. But it happened what, overnight. You know, right. this is something unheard of. This would have taken us years in the past. But we, we literally rolled it out in two evenings, I think the team did. And it's and it suddenly provided a safe route for cycling. So during the pandemic, I think we, we rolled out over 100 kilometers worth of, um, of, uh, of, of bike lanes in, in a little less than nine months. You know, we had, um, we had these the transformation of these pavements. But one of the most exciting things, and certainly one of the most talked about things, was if you move on to the next slide, um, uh, the, the next slide is actually upgrading existing cycle lanes. These are some old cycle lanes that weren't good enough. And we ended up putting in some bollar, you know, a bit of light protection. Again, cheap and cheerful, but transforms it from somebody being people feeling vulnerable on the road to being safe. Yeah. Um, 
But we also, comes back to what we were talking about in terms of filtering the traffic, we also brought in, this is not a new concept, but low traffic neighborhoods where you take traffic cells, uh, yeah. a bit like Barcelona, where you begin to bring in the, um, and you, you literally, we put plant pots down. Uh, and so the next slide shows we, we rolled out more than 100 of these. One borough, so London's broken down into boroughs, a bit like you know New York and other, other major cities. Um, one borough is now 23% of the city of these low traffic neighborhoods. And it, it resulted in a transformation. Now, there was a lot of backlash against uh, these um, uh, because people, oh, you know, can't get my, can't drive, I can't drive directly to my house. Now, everyone can drive to their house if they need to and they'll get their refuge taken away and X, Y, Z. But it was about filtering it so you don't get the cut through traffic. You know, we saw um, driving fall, uh, traffic fall, evolution improve, walking, cycling improve. What, but what was interesting is that recently, over the last decade, the m- number of collisions that have, uh, people being hit by in, 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 on residential roads have increased by 38% in mm. London. Yeah. Um, what we saw was in the academic study showed that actually when you put in these low traffic neighbourhoods, a 50% fall in collision rates in the first six months of these going in. You know, that's, that's unheard of in terms of the, the benefits of growth for safety. So suddenly you're creating safe, clean environments for people to, to move through mimicking in a way what i was talking about those spaces for family when you reduce the traffic people enjoy the streets people take to the streets they use them differently right. and now these are being you know many of these we've got over 100 now that are being rolled out and many of these are being made permanent changes so we saw huge changes the next the next slide i, I love these this is one of the best things i think that we've uh, no sorry next uh, uh, skip this one that's not uh, here, this is a what we're calling school streets. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is where you close the street around a school at drop off time and pick up time. Yeah. So as I said earlier, quarter of a million car journeys every morning are associated with the school run. Right. These are designed to make it safer around schools. Yeah. These are designed to stop the air pollution around schools. These are designed to enable more kids to walk and cycle and scoot to school. Yeah, right. making it them healthier and their well-being better. When we started a year and a half ago, we had I think eleven in London. We've now got over three hundred and seventy. Yeah, hmm. we've hit the walk to school target that, that we that I set, uh, you know, two years early. You know, hmm. because people are actually doing it. This and while some of the cycle schemes and some of the um, some of the the, the low traffic neighbourhoods can create massive backlash, these are. These are so supported across the political spectrum. Yeah, right. people are wanting more of these. If you say, you know, well, does your kid want, you know, want to bring in, uh, you know, do your kid want to breathe clean air? Your kid wants to walk to school. Your, you know, do you want your kid to be safe in their neighbourhood? You bring in the children aspect on this. It totally transforms it. I think this is a gateway drug for active travel right. because suddenly more people are wanting them. Why wouldn't you want this? It's just you're just restricting the movement of traffic for drop off time and pick up time, making it yeah. safe for those local journeys. But it begins to transform our city and the way that people think about the city as well. I don't need my car for every journey. Um, right. I, I love these. This is, I think, one of the best things that happened in London in the last decade. And it's wonderful to see so many kids walking and cycling to school. Yeah, yeah. It And you're absolutely right. I mean, what a wonderful gateway to... Uh, seeing a transformation of a community is to, you know, bring it down to that, that level of saying, yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want the children in a community to be able to uh, be able to walk and bike, uh, to be able to get to a school, to be able to get to a park, to be able to get to their friend's place. And what's wonderful about that too, is that it fits into the scheme of, of what I, what I talk about all the time of, when it comes to creating a culture of activity within a community, it truly has to be all ages and abilities. And so this really emphasized the youngest of, of, of that age group. And then you, you start to look at all ages and you start saying, well, OK, now is it also, you know, truly safe and inviting for, you know, an 80 year old or a 90 year old? Uh, to be able to either either cycle or if they may have a mobility device. And so then you start 
transitioning into all abilities. And you're looking at, at individuals with that may have uh, physical um, uh, disabilities that may need a mobility device. And you're starting to realize that, yeah, these schemes can help serve all of these purposes. And essentially, it's it's just transforming our public realm, our streets, into being more for people. It, it, exactly. I think, you know, we are, where are we now with all of this? That we've learned a huge amount, that we can do stuff faster, we can do stuff quickly. But we one, I think, just putting down plant pots are the sort of first stage of this. But when right. you mentioned the sort of issue around uh, people with mobility aids or people with disabilities, you know, you can restrict the traffic, but then you also need to put the drop curbs in so that people can cross the road where they want to. And, and, and there's a sort of there's a, another phase to come on this. So, you know, the temporary measures only go so far. And I think the other thing you've learned, we've, I've learned certainly, is you can't do everything in temporary measures. You know, the cheap, cheerful plastic material actually you got some pretty nasty junctions that need really overhauling with new signals, new civils, new drainage, new, you know, that sort of stuff. That's a, that, that requires proper full on engineering. You can't do that with um, things. So where I want to move forward with this is how can we use a sort of more hybrid approach using where we can use these sort of roll things out faster and quickly and cheaply and experiment and try things, which with it, all of this has facilitated us to do. But then at the same time, when we there are some areas where we really need to keep the sort of, the, you know, the solid new good um, uh, proper overhaul happening, uh, which costs more money. It takes more time. Um, but there's there's no other choice uh, in some of these locations. So I, I'm trying to encourage our teams to to really um, to really to, ex- to, to 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 think. You know, actually, we can do things cheaper. We can do things faster. Yeah. Um, we can deliver more. But uh, we, we you know it, it's it, it's provided an amazing opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a little bit of your artwork here that uh, you know clearly you you, oh, yes. you took, so the, was... took the time to to put on. Uh, on the streets here. And I guess that's uh, to, to kind of close us out. Um, the activation and the inspiration that comes from creating streets that, uh, you know, are, are truly uh, welcoming places for, for kids and for children. Um, and, and, and you have to just love, you know, this little, little uh, uh, diagram here. Is this actually drawn by a child um, i don't know i think it was actually so so the previous one with the kids drawing all over the, pa- the mm-hmm. pavement and the, the street what was just sort of a, 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 just how popular some of this stuff became got it yeah. this was sort of um this was a brilliant piece of one of the things i've also learned is the importance of engaging people in a new way and just coming up with you know i've, I've long thought that people struggle to read sort of architectural plans and right. you know then and so things you you need to you need to engage people in a way that works and i i, I saw this as, as a consultation for and a sort of an engagement exercise on a low traffic neighborhood in, yeah. in in south london in lambert one of the councils and i just thought wow this this explains it this is it, and, and 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 again you know the complicated cad drawings of sort of demonstrating the the height of each curb isn't going to actually tell the story of what we're trying to achieve here and, yeah. and allow people to engage and allow more people than normal, the, 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 and allow a greater number of people to contribute to this, which will help make the scheme. So I love this. I love this drawing. And for me, it was just, yeah, this, this is the way forward. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. So to close us out, is there anything that we haven't yet discussed um, that you really think we, we need to leave the audience, both the, both the visual audience uh, watching this video as well as the audio uh, audience out there? Uh, let's close it out strong. What, what have we missed? So I think the one thing we have, we, we talked a bit about safety here yeah. and we talked a bit about the cycling. We talked about how we make safer streets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> right. But, one of the things I, um, as so many other people, I know people who've, who've lost their lives or, or, or family and friends who've, of people who've, who've lost their lives on through, through, road, through, through road collisions and, 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 and through road traffic collisions. <clears throat> and so one of the things, in addition to enabling the act of travel, we've also set ourselves a goal of eliminating deaths and serious injuries on our roads in London, the Vision Zero approach, which is making the street safer, which yeah. is key making the speed safer. So we know if we reduce the speeds, we'll make it safer, which, you know, 20 miles an hour, 50% of London is now 20 miles an hour as a, as a city, which is great and increasing. We've got the, we're working hand in hand with the police uh, 
uh, which is which is which is fantastic. How we enforce that speeding, how we stop people driving, looking at their mobile phones, and that sort of thing. But one of the things I think we ha- just haven't touched on is actually the safety of vehicles, and I think there's huge potential here. Trucks, heavy goods vehicles, trucks are disproportionately da- uh, disproportionately more dangerous than any other form of road on our on our roads. So, the fifty percent of cyclists, twenty one percent of uh, pedestrian fatalities are due on London's roads are due to heavy goods vehicles, the big trucks, um, and they only make up four percent of the road kilometres. And when I looked at this, I remember getting into a cab with a with a policeman. The guy was the guy. It was it was a cop. He was like six six foot eight. He was a big guy, and he stood next to the the cab of this truck. Um, and uh, and I couldn't see him from the driver's seat. I just couldn't see him. And somehow we've accepted the 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 fact that we've designed trucks with no direct vision that you can you can put 26 cyclists down the side of an average truck and you can't see one of them yeah right. it's a little little surprise that people are getting so one of the things that i'm really pleased about is we've brought in a system called direct vision standard in london there's a there's a i think there's a little when you click forward one there's a little image ex- explaining what it is uh next one one to another one next one oh this one yeah uh, here yeah so you look at this red truck, there's a red truck and it shows the direct vision standard and there's someone standing in front of it. You can't see them from the driver. There's a motorcyclist and a cyclist standing next to the truck. They yeah. can't see it. We've said, actually, if you're going to drive these trucks into London, you will have to, you need to fit cameras, sensors, motion sensors around them, or you'll pay a £560 fine every day. Yeah. What we're doing is bringing in a, we rated them and we brought in, this is a, the truck at the top, so called a direct vision standard. It's five stars. The bottom one is a zero star in the amount of vision. And that shows that actually the driver can see everything coming out. So what we need to do with changing the design of trucks and the European Commission have just accepted this approach too, which will design out the whole problem in the way that, you know, from manufacturing onwards. And so, for me, there are so many technological opportunities as well to make our streets safer by making our you know, uh, our vehicles safer as well. And I, I think this is, you know, something that everybody focuses on the on the streets. Important speeds, important, but we also need to make sure that our vehicles are fit for the urban environment because we'll always need some vehicles, uh, and the vehicles that we have in our cities need to enable active travel and active towns uh, rather than create a threat to it. Yeah. And don't get me started on the trend that's uh, going wild here in North America right now with the uh, the <laughs> consumer pickup trucks that are becoming oh. so and and SUVs that are becoming so huge that same thing uh, the the vi- the the visibility of a child or a small adult uh, uh, directly in front of one of these vehicles they cannot see them. So it's, it's, crazy. It's, it's, it's scary. It's yeah. just scary. And, and, you know, and, and most of these things are not being used to pick up anything. You right. know, <laughs> it's why are we why are we why are we tolerating? It's like it's called a pickup truck for a reason. <laughs> what are you picking up? Uh, I, I do want to go back to uh, the effect of speed real quick, because, um, yeah. you know, quite frankly, it's one of the things that uh, um, we have focused on a lot more recently. But uh, the, the reminder is is there, uh, of course, uh, notably over a decade ago, the 20 is plenty uh, campaign uh, was launched there in the UK. And um, and I know that. Uh, you mentioned 50% or over 50% of the streets are now at 20 miles per, per hour. Um, give a little bit of context to, to that sort of grassroots effort that took place, where you guys are at now, this slide, where do you, where do you want to go with all this? So I've, I'm, you know, the 20, 20 is plenty campaign captured a, you know, just, I came back to this point that Cities change because of campaigning communities and the campaigns to reduce speed on our roads have been, you know, it, it's cut and people really understand it and buy it. If, you know, if you're hit by a car traveling at, um, you know, if you're hit by a car traveling at 40 miles an hour, 31 percent of people are killed. If you're hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, one percent are killed. Yeah, that's the that's the physics. What's interesting about this slide, which is rarely talked about, is if you're older, so if you're over 60 and you're hit at 40 miles an hour, 98% of people are killed. Yeah. 
at 20 miles an hour, that drops to 5% of people. So, you know, this is, you, you take the average, it's astonishing, but for the most vulnerable people in, in our communities, the young and the old, and we could have one for younger people too, it's disproportionately more important. So this for me is so, it, 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 it's again, it's a, it's a, um, Control parking, school streets, and twenty mile an hour thing are just the basics that people can do to help make their their communities safer and start this this process. Um, clearly, that then needs enforcement. So you need the police to be engaged in this. You also need to design your streets so that they actually feel like twenty miles an hour. You know, yeah, just sticking yeah. up a sign. You know, it, 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 it's part of it. But I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm it, it's such a good piece. It's it, of campaigning from 20 is plenty. It sparks change ac- around the world, and and we will continue to deliver this. And and the mayor is committed to accelerating the rollout of of 20 miles an hour on on the streets that we control. There are only five percent of London streets. The rest of the streets occur. The highway authorities are the councils, and more and more councils in in London are saying yes. 20 is plenty. We're going to do that. Fantastic. And and we mentioned it earlier when we were talking about um, being able to uh, create a, an environment that really, truly engages people and encourages people to uh, want to ride their bikes. The same thing, you know, holds with with um, our built infrastructure and our streets. If we were really looking to, uh, to to get people to drive slowly, you just mentioned it. We need to get that design right get those streets uh, so that the design speed of those streets is in fact, actually, is in, in fact um, encouraging and reinforcing the fact that this is a slow street environment. This is, as the Dutch use, you know, this is where the, the automobile is as guest, you know, the auto to gast uh, part of it. And, uh, and 20 miles per hour is right at that same sort of threshold of speed that is appropriate for that shared space. Uh, it's 30 kilometers per hour in, in the Netherlands and, and for all the other uh, uh, metric <laughs> folks, countries out yeah. there that are Listening listening in. in and tuning into this uh, it is and that is right around 17 miles per hour. So it's right in that same uh, area there. This is a fatality uh, chart, and it doesn't even touch the, uh, on the fact that serious it's, injuries are, you know, are just, yeah. you know, it, that's a whole uh, other side know, of it. We, yeah. In, exactly. And, you know, the difference between a serious injury and a fatality are centimeters and seconds, aren't yeah. they? You know, it, it, it's such a small division. And I, the way that, you know, again, thinking about how we use data in this space, I, you know, we, we use the sort of the, 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 the serious injuries as, as the data set here because it's, um, you know, there are more of them and sad, you know, and, and, and it's, and, and it's, that's, that's what we need to look at because, Serious injuries change lives, um, as much, you know, in a, in a very serious way, and, and, and some of the things can be, if some of the injuries can be life changing. And if you're a data nerd like I am, <laughs> as I know you are, um, the the other interesting aspect of this is the uh, the collision avoided. And that is part of the beauty of having these um, speeds reduced is that the interactions that then can take place when you're talking about uh, mixing of modes and people on bikes, people walking, people in cars, but at the same time, if you're moving at more human speed, you, the, the, the collision never even happens because you're able to um, have that communication with you know, each other and you, know, you may have some near misses, but they're also not as quote unquote scary. Um, and so the beauty, the true beauty of this environment when you can try to bring the speeds down to more human speed is that the collision, the crash never even happens. Exactly. And that's yeah. what we need to do. We need to design yeah. this out so that it, it's a systemic change and design it out so it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, it has been such a pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank well, you so much. Thank you, John. It's been brilliant. And I, I yeah, I look forward to hearing, I've certainly looked forward to hearing more of your podcasts in, in the future. 
Thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode with Will Norman. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly had a great time uh, chatting with him and learning more about the great things happening in London. Uh, gosh, I really wish I had more time <laughs> coming up in October. I would love to spend some time over there in uh, in London seeing some of the wonderful things that are happening uh, on the ground when I make my trip uh, to the Netherlands uh, in October. Again, I'll be heading over to attend the International Cargo Bike Festival, and if you are in interested in joining me, uh, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Again, that email address is john at activetowns.org. And uh, if you like this episode, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below, and uh, share it with a friend. And if you haven't already done so, please, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. It really does help out quite a bit. And don't forget to ring that notifications bell at the same time, because that helps identify what your notifications preferences might be. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, wait, one more thing. <laughs> the Active Town Store. Head on over to the Active Town Store and check out some of the cool Streets for People uh, swag that I have out there. Again, uh, anytime somebody buys something from the store or becomes a patron on uh, my Patreon account, uh, it helps me keep things moving along and producing this content uh, each week for you and uh, also helps me uh, be able to travel and get to uh, some of these uh, locations to be able to profile. So again, anything that you can do to support uh, the Active Towns movement and this channel is greatly appreciated. Well, that's it for now. So this is John signing off, wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.